this morning. We are in our new series called I Am. Last few weeks, we've looked at what the Bible has to say about Jesus, the kind of person that he was. And now we're going to look at some things that Jesus had to say about himself. And these are really important statements. There are seven I Am statements in the book of John. Uh, We're not going to look at them in order, but we're going to look at them as a point of emphasis. So if you have your Bibles, you go ahead and turn to John chapter 8. That's where we're going to be. You can download our app that we have through our app store, and there's a Bible um, portion on that if you click on Sunday morning. And so check that out, download our app, and you can get some information about the church as well. You know, one of the things about preaching is I get these huge lights that are like right in my face. The last church that I was at, the lights would literally be so bright, I couldn't see anybody in church, but up here I could actually see all of you. So I know when you're asleep, I know when you're awake, um, you know, kind of like Santa Claus, right? But there's something about a light that puts emphasis on exposing the darkness. You guys want to be able to see me and see me clearly, so there's this grand spotlight. But it hurts my eyes. It's like, have you ever walked into a movie theater from being outside? And you go inside, it's dark, and you feel like you're blind because you can't see anything. And it takes a little while for your eyes to adjust. I was talking to my mom, it was a a few years ago, but she went to see a movie. Me and my mom, that's what we always used to do, go see movies. A lot of fun. And so she went into this movie theater, and of course, you have that natural transition where it's really dark and your eyes are trying to adjust. But she walks in, and it is really dark. And nothing is changing for her. And she's telling me this story. And she says, I sat down, and it even got to the point where it was in the first few minutes of the movie, and it was dark, and I'm sitting there getting upset. I'm like, this is ridiculous, you know what I mean? I paid money to come and see this movie, and it's so dark that I I can hardly even see it. And right before she gets to go talk to the manager, she realizes she had left her sunglasses on the entire time. Can you, I could just see her there getting all upset, like, this is ridiculous, you know what I mean? And, she's, and then that clicks in her own mind. She's complaining to her husband, being like, we paid money for this and it's all dark. And she left her sunglasses on the entire time. It's amazing what can happen in your life and in your perspective when you remove the darkness from your vision and from how you see things. One of the hardest aspects of a parent is trying to take care of your kids in the dark. Man, you guys know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have kids, we just had our baby boy Knox. He's almost three months old. And it's 3 a.m. and he's crying. And I'm like, well, I don't think he needs fed, so I'll just give him his binky. And basically you wake up at 3 a.m. and you don't even know who you are. And this baby's screaming and you're trying to take care of him. And so you stumble into his room. And what Angel does, nine times out of ten, she leaves the binky at his feet. Why? So that when you're blind at 3 a.m., you can go get the binky and put it in his mouth. Couldn't find the binky. I'm literally just going around it like this. And I'm thinking in my mind, please, God, just help me find the binky. And I can't see. And then finally, my eyes are starting to adjust, and I can see, like, the outline of him. And I'm able to get the binky. I find it. It's right where Angel said it would be, and I just didn't feel for that part. Which, For those of you who know me, it's kind of my thing. And so I finally get the binky, and I'm trying to... It's like a game, like a carnival game, you know what I mean? Because he's going like this, and he's crying, and I'm trying to get the binky in, and I can't see anything. And so what do I have to do? Finally have to go on, have to turn on the light so I can actually see what's going on. And so that's exactly what Jesus was. We get frustrated, we're walking in darkness, we're trying to be the person that God wants us to be, but we're incapable. Why? Because we don't have the light The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 that when Jesus proclaimed and started preaching in his ministry, he fulfilled Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 2, which says this, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. That's what Jesus' ministry was, a shining big light for us to be able to see. Now, I want you to bear with me a little bit this morning because I'm going to give you some background to John chapter 8. Because the background, when you realize the background and the setting, it makes the story that much more powerful. If you go back to chapter 7, and I don't want you to, but I just want you to trust me because I'm a reliable guy. If you go back to chapter 7 verse 1, you're going to find that there's this feast going on that's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Maybe some of your translation has what's called the Feast of Booths. And this was one of the seven feasts that God instructed the people of Israel to have. Yes, God told his people to have fun and party and remember what it was like to be delivered. And so they had this Feast of Tabernacles to celebrate, to have a party, to dance and to sing God's deliverance of them out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Now, there's a little bit of a rebuke in there because it took 40 years to get there. So God not only wants them to remember the goodness of God and how he delivered them from Egypt, but also where stubbornness can get you. 
where a hard heart can get you. And so there would be tens of thousands, some scholars actually estimate millions of people descending upon the land of Jerusalem, and they were instructed to build these booths or, or small tabernacles, like a lean-to, so to speak, and they would live in them, and they would have an eight-day celebration. So there would be food, there would be sacrifices. There were so many sacrifices going on at that time that they had to have 24 teams of priests that were just continually offering up these sacrifices. I mean, it was awesome. Like I said, there was dancing, there was singing. And I want you to look at John chapter 8 because I want to set this stage for you. Look what it says in verse 20. This is actually the last verse in our passage of Scripture this morning. In verse 20, it shows us the location of where Jesus shares his message. Look at it. It'll be up on the screen for you too. It says in verse 20 that these words he spoke in the treasury... As he taught in the temple, and no one seized him. They tried to kill him about three times because of the message that he shared. But no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. I've got a picture for you of Herod's temple up on the screen. And I know it might be a little hard to see, but basically you see this big open space inside the perimeter walls. And that was called the court of the Gentiles, right? Anybody could go in there. Um, It's where uh, Jesus would um, teach during the time and Gentiles could go in there. You didn't even have to be a Jew to go in there. And then you actually had the next court in, which was only for Jewish men and women who were proselytes or authentic Jews. It's called the court of women. This is where the treasury would have been held. And basically, they would have had a a little over a dozen of these round cylinder horns that you would put your money into, and it would go down into a container. And they had them spread out all over the place because there were so many people. Some horns were meant for people to go in and buy sacrifices. Other horns were like general tithe boxes. But there's this huge court of women, and there are thousands of people inside of this court. Okay? Thousands of people. There's, there's about 150 people in here this morning, maybe, maybe closer to 200 in this auditorium, not counting the kids in the rooms. Can you imagine, right? Thousands of people inside of this court. Then the next court in was where the priests were able to go, and they were able to take people with them to make sacrifices. But the women weren't allowed in there, um, and so it was a, a special place where the offering would be sacrificed. Here's what's so cool. So during this Feast of Tabernacles, right, they would not only have all these places to give, but they had a Levitical choir. I mean, you want to talk about uh, music. The, the music that they played would have had hundreds of instruments, and they would play every single night, and they would feast. They would be dancing and singing. Now, I am not a dancer, right? I don't have an ounce of rhythm in my body. And, but so, like, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but I imagine being there with Jesus, like, did Jesus dance? I mean, this is all I got right here, Okay. This is all me, all day. If I go to a wedding, this is what you're going to see me do. I've got no rhythm. I'm just going back and forth. But I wonder if Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Like Jesus danced and, and, he, and he sang and he, and he had fun with the Jews, the people of this time. This is the whole point of the Feast of Tabernacles. And what I like to think about, I like, I like to think about Psalms 27.1. Maybe this would have been a song that they would be singing. Um, it says this. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalms 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And one of the reasons why I think they would sing songs like this, I've got another picture I want to show you, is because there would be four gigantic candelabras that would be stationed throughout the court of women. And these candles would burn all light. They would take a 10-gallon uh, pitcher full of oil, and they would carry it up a ladder, and they would dump it in so that this gigantic candle, four of them, could be lit, and it would be lit all night. Historians say this kind of light show would have been like a shining diamond that you could see outside of Jerusalem. I mean, it was incredible, the kind of light show that was going on. And so if you can imagine thousands of people singing, dancing, declaring the deliverance of God, there's this immaculate light show that's going on by these huge four candelabras that you could see from from a long distance away. It was so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful scenes that you could ever imagine. And here is Jesus getting ready to share one of the most important passages of Scripture in John chapter 8, verse 12. Let's read it together. It says, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will walk, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Think about that scene for a moment. 
being there with Jesus. Now, we don't know if it was during the nighttime when the light show was going on or during the daytime. And one of the cool things that I like to think about is maybe it was during the daytime and the candles went out. And as they are going up to relight the candles and put the oil back in, Jesus takes this opportunity as they see these beautiful candelabras and he says, I am the light of the world. In other words, God delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians. And these lights that you see are a reminder of that, but they go out and you have to keep filling them. I'm the light of the world and I'm not going anywhere. I don't run out. I don't get empty. I am here forever. And for those of you who follow me will have the light of life. Very, very powerful passage of scripture. The Bible talked about this. One of the reasons why it was so powerful is to, became, uh, to, to claim to be the light of the world is a claim to be the promised Messiah in the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus was sitting there with the people of God, the Jewish nation, this wonderful light show, this wonderful festival, and they were celebrating the deliverance of God, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In other words, I am the one that was promised to you to come about to not just deliver you from the world around you, from the Egyptians, and celebrate that, but I am here to deliver you from your sins, and not just you as the Gentiles, but the entire world. Not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. Isaiah, for instance, chapter 42, verse 6 he looked forward to a day where God says this Messiah will be a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, 6 says this, My salvation shall reach the ends of the earth. One day I'm going to send a man who's going to be the Messiah, and he is going to provide a bright shining light, not just to the Jewish nation, but to the entire world. And here is Jesus in the midst of this light show claiming, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you will have the light of life. Now, as I said, in John chapter 7, they tried to kill Jesus about three times because Jesus claimed not only to be the Messiah, but also to be God in the flesh. I'd like to re read the rest of the story to you. Look what it says here in verse 13. It says, So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it's been written that the testimony of two men is true, and I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were going to say to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So I'd like to explain to you a little bit about what's going on. First of all, in verse 13, they're attempting to invalidate the claims of Jesus by appealing to their old law, their own law, which was found in the Old Testament. And what basically they were appealing to in this passage of Scripture was that a testimony of truth could only be established in the presence of two or three witnesses. And Jesus responds to them. He rebukes them. He says, look, even if I do testify about myself, he says in verse 14, my testimony is true for I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. They're trying to do two things to Jesus. Number one, they're trying to turn his own words against him, but they're manipulating it. They're twisting it. In John chapter 5 verse 31, Jesus says this, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. That's the first thing they're trying to do. Secondly, they're trying to appeal to the old law, which is Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. And they're trying to invalidate the truthful claims of Jesus because basically they're saying, listen, Jesus, you're testifying about yourself. The old law says you have to have two or three witnesses. So we know what you're saying isn't true. Now, the reason why this is pure manipulation is for a few reasons. First of all, in John chapter 5, the claim that Jesus was making was not a judicial claim in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 19. 
The context of Deuteronomy chapter 19 is when a man charges another man with a sin. In order for that to be validated in a court of law, you have to have two or three witnesses. That's the whole point. But Jesus wasn't charging anybody with a sin, right? He wasn't saying, you guys are sinning, and here's my claim that needs to be backed up. Jesus was saying, I am the Messiah and the Son of God. And he proved himself to be the Messiah and Son of God through three ways, right? Number one, he showed it by his miracles. He performed miracles that hardened their heart to such a great degree that they were forced to reject Jesus. They saw what he did. They heard about what he did, and yet, through their willful blindness, they chose to reject it. So number one, Jesus' claims are valid because he was a miracle worker. Number two, he showed it through his character, the testimony of his character. The man did not sin. When they brought charges against him, they didn't stick. So the only way to get rid of this guy named Jesus is to say lies about him that aren't true. But Jesus says, look, I have lived in accordance with the law and with God's uh, um, path for my life, and I've done the right things, and what you guys say about me isn't true. And number three, he appeals to the authority of Scripture. You see, one of the problems that these Pharisees have is they are trying to discourage and diminish the ministry of Jesus by manipulating and twisting Scripture and by falsely accusing him of things that aren't true. And Jesus says, look, even if I do testify about myself, my testimony is true. First and foremost, that was a direct uh, slam against their ideology and against their mission. But that was them saying this, look, the law was made for you guys. The law was made for people like you who are lying and manipulating. The law wasn't made for me as God's son, as the Messiah. And even if I only testified about myself, my testimony is true. Why? Why? I've worked miracles, I've lived a sinless life, and I have fulfilled all the scriptures that talk about the Messiah. And so here is Jesus going toe-to-toe with these Pharisees, and they are being willfully ignorant and blind. Look what it says in verse 14. Jesus rebukes them, and he says, You do not know where I've come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. You see, there is a difference between believing in Jesus because of the facts not believing in Jesus because you're ignorant, and then willfully choosing to reject what is true and remaining in your ignorance. A lot of people just simply don't know. They're ignorant of certain facts. A lot of people do know. They have experienced. They have tasted and seen and studied, and yet they willfully choose to remain in the ignorance of their sin. And that's exactly where these Pharisees are at. They were willfully ignorant of the basic facts about Jesus. I mean, they thought that he was somebody from Nazareth. They didn't even take the time to ask Jesus where he was born in Bethlehem. They didn't believe Jesus was a descendant of David. They didn't even do the basic research of finding out who his mother and his father was. And they rejected his miracles. And this is how belief, uh, unbelief operates, guys. You can never have enough proof or evidence to convince someone who is determined to reject the facts. And that's exactly where these Pharisees are. Unbelief never has enough proof because it's grounded in the sin of pride. And all these Pharisees cared about in this moment was justifying themselves. They thought that they could hide their sin and the manipulation of Scripture and falsely accusing Jesus, and they ultimately wanted to kill him. Why? Because as the light of the world, as a great light shining in the shadow of death, When you come into contact with Jesus, he starts exposing and revealing aspects of your life that you've never wanted to confront before. Your sin, your selfishness, your worldview, how you go about life, what you're called to for eternal life. And so they wanted to get rid of this guy. They didn't know where Jesus ultimately came from, which was eternity past, and they didn't know where he was going. They thought, man, if we could just get this guy in the grave, but little did they know that it would be the means of the grave that would cause Jesus to ascend to the throne of heaven. They thought that they could hide from God, but Jesus knows their thoughts. There's a few verses I'd like to share with you. Here's the first one. Job chapter 34 verse 2 says, There is no darkness or deep shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. These Pharisees thought they could hide. Sometimes we think we can hide, and we may do a good job. We may put on a smiling face when we come to church. We may have this persona that we got life together and we're not broken. We don't struggle with our sin. But God sees everything, and there is no amount of words or time or space or clothing that could prevent God from seeing who you truly are. 
He sees us. Daniel chapter 2 verse 22 says this, It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells in him. We may be able to fake each other out, but we can't fake God. The Pharisees couldn't fake out Jesus. Look what else it goes on to say in verse 15. Jesus says, I don't judge like you. He says, you judge according to the flesh, but I judge no one. And what we should take that to mean isn't that Jesus doesn't judge, but he doesn't judge like them. To judge according to the flesh is to judge superficially. The Pharisees judged everyone. They were complete hypocrites, and they wanted to judge Jesus even though they didn't even know the truth about where he came from and who his parents were. But yet they wanted to sit in judgment on Jesus because they couldn't get past his flesh. To to sit in judgment literally means to look somebody up and down, and yet they refuse to acknowledge this. John says this, that in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. They refused to acknowledge John 1, 14, that says this light, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why couldn't they judge in the right manner? It's because they were blinded by their flesh. Superficial judgment. And we all know people like this, right? And maybe we have even struggled ourselves in this arena. We look at people and we judge them by their appearance. We look at people and we judge them by their skin color or where they've come from as a family member or what kind of job they have, what kind of social status they come from. Superficial judgment. You know, it seems like several times a year I read about another case of when a man is convicted of rape or murder and he has spent 10, 12, 14, 20 years in prison and they exonerate him at the end because they found out that he wasn't guilty. I just read a story just this last week. Guy was in prison for 14 years accused of a rape that he never committed. It's terrible. I mean, can you imagine spending 14 years of your life, 20 years of your life for something that you never did? It's because when he went to a court of law, they didn't have all the facts. They didn't have all the answers. They went off of a certain amount of evidence, and then they rendered a conclusion. And Jesus is saying, look, I don't judge like you because I have all the facts. I see everything. There's nowhere that you can hide from me. I never get it wrong. The Bible says that when we judge, we are not to give preference because of a person's position. A family member, a friend, popularity. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. It specifically says you are to hear both sides of the story. Literally, the great and the small. doesn't matter if you're poor or you're rich. When it comes to a problem, you are to hear both sides of the story and then render your judgment. Proverbs says this. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and a shame to him. Sometimes we do this in marriage, (laughs) right? You've already got your answer prepared before they even say anything. Because your mind's made up. It's folly. It's shame. It's not wise. Especially when we deal with each other in the church, or you have problems in your family or with your friends. You are a fool if you only hear one side of the story. Even more so, you're a fool if you hear one side of the story and you judge according to that. You, you actually base your actions off of somebody's story. And look, this is tough because there are people that we love, that we respect, that we value in the church, right? We want to believe each other. But even though they're your friend or your family member, you still need to hear the other side of the story. There's always two sides to it. And truth is somewhere right there in the middle. And so Proverbs says you're a fool if you have already made up your answer before you've actually heard the facts. It says in Proverbs 18, 17, the first to please his case seems right until another comes and examines him. Don't get caught up in the emotion of hearing the first story. Be a wise person that hears both the great and the small and then render your judgment. If someone has upset you or if something has upset you, give them the benefit of the doubt and listen to them. Hear them out. Don't just cast the judgment and be a coward behind closed doors. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Pharisees were guilty against. They didn't even give Jesus the time of the day and they rendered their conclusion. And then the teachers of the law saw his miracles, heard his teaching, and remained willfully ignorant and blind of the truth. And so that's why Jesus rebukes them here in this moment. 
The Bible says that a balanced scale that has unbalanced measurements, right, is an abomination. When it comes to hearing stories about people, when it comes to getting involved in arguments or disputes, the Bible is absolutely clear. You are foolish if you fail to take into account both sides. And that's exactly what these Jews were guilty of. And you know, the bad news is that people do this all the time. They do it in the church. They do it out in the world, right? I mean, haven't we all felt that? Haven't we all maybe even been guilty of that ourselves? People like, for instance, non-Christians, they don't come to church because they base what they believe about church and about the world around them off of a limited amount of information. Maybe they haven't researched the different arguments for the existence of God. Maybe they haven't looked at the historical argument for the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe they've never considered the evidence, and so they're only hearing one side of the story. Christians even do this in the church. You get upset, you get your feelings hurt, you share that with another person, that other person makes up their mind and judges another individual and fails to take out um, themselves of the equation and look at the evidence, hear the other side of the story. And so people sometimes will leave the church only hearing one side of the story. That's not how we should operate. The Bible is clearly against it. And so to the non-Christian, I want to encourage you this morning, look at both sides. Examine the evidence. Don't just want atheism to be true. See if God does exist and Christianity is true. And by the way, we are going to be doing a sermon series here in a few weeks after this I Am series. We're going to be looking at the evidence. Does God exist? If you have friends that are atheists, uh, maybe you even yourself have struggled believing whether or not God exists and is that something we can trust in, really want to encourage you to come out to that series and invite your friends and family to it. I promise I'll handle it the best way I possibly can, okay? So to the non-Christian, look at both sides of the argument. To the Christian in the church, hear both sides of the story before making your decision. And if you fail to seek out the other side, you are just as guilty as the Pharisees are in this situation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, we're not going to turn there, but he says, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the same measure you use will be measured against you. He says, when you judge somebody... Take the gigantic plank that's in your eye and remove it, and then you'll be able to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. If you have done some harmful things to God, if you have lived in sin and made bad decisions, and God extended grace to you and that's what you want, how should you treat other people in the church when they sin against you? Shouldn't you give them grace and mercy and kindness and compassion? If you hold them according to the law, and if you're not willing to forgive them, guess what? You're in big trouble. Because the Bible says God's going to measure you with the same measurement you measure other people. If you hold on to past sins that are two and three years ago, people in the church, and you don't let them go and you don't forgive them, guess what? God's going to hold you accountable for those sins you committed two and three years ago. That's what the Bible teaches. So if you expect God to treat you fairly and kindly and compassionately, you should be doing the same thing. Judge people with balanced scales, not through the hypocritical lens of darkness. Jesus goes on to say this in verses 16 and 18. So first of all, if you'll recall back, he said, first of all, even if I do testify about myself, I'm not like you. The law was made for you. I'm the Messiah. I speak the truth. Here's my claim. But then he goes on. He validates his claim. How does he do that? First of all, he appeals to the formal conditions of the law. He says, I testify and my father testifies about me. There would have been no way, no way Jesus could have performed the miracles that he performed if God was not with this man. You cannot raise people from the dead, walk on water, calm the storm, and do the things that Jesus did if you don't have the testimony of the father. And so Jesus says, look, I'll meet you where where you're at. You want to try to invalidate my claims? I do testify about myself as the number one witness. And second of all, the Father testifies on my behalf as well. So he challenges them. Second of all, he appeals to the authority of Scripture. A man born in Bethlehem, descended from David, fulfilling these scriptures that we've read thus far in the book of Isaiah about how there's been a great light that has been shown and he's preached the gospel and he's done these incredible things. And some of these, some of these conditions in the Old Testament were incapable for him to fulfill, like where he was born and who his parents were. A few weeks ago, we talked a little bit about this, some of the miracles that Jesus performed, but even some of the prophecy that Jesus uh, fulfilled and that were out of his control. 
And so Jesus appeals to the testimony of Scripture and his miracles. What's the problem? All right? What's the big deal? What's the issue here? The issue is this. They are not authentic followers of God. They're merely going through the motions. They're merely appealing to the law, fitting in with their social culture, but their heart is far from God. He says in verse 19, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Their lack of understanding of Jesus revealed a whole lot about their lack of understanding of God. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you proclaim to follow me? But in what comes to your actions and your behavior and how you treat other people, it was almost as if you've never even read the Bible. What's the greatest commandment in the Old Testament? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And here they are seeking out to kill Jesus. Couldn't even fulfill the basic greatest command because they're not authentic followers of God. And sometimes there are people in the church that give the church a bad name because they don't clothe themselves in compassion and kindness and grace and they're mean and they're nasty. And you're like, no way that this person is an authentic follower of God. And we may never know that until the day of judgment. But Jesus gives us this powerful statement. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? Maybe you've committed abortion. Maybe you've been an adulterer and a drunk and a gossip. And you expect God to forgive you of those things. But when you come into contact with people in the church or your family or at work, do you give them the same grace and forgiveness that God has given you? And if not, why not? That's the question. If not, why not? Jesus says, a man who listens to my words and does not do what I say is like a man who builds his house upon a foundation of sand, and when the rains and the winds came, the house was ruined. And he's speaking about the social condition, or about the spiritual condition of the person. Destruction in the end, because it was never authentic. How do we know if the Pharisees are authentic followers of Jesus? Because they do what he says. But Jesus didn't just stop with a theological claim to be God and the Messiah. He acted and he promised this. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, Jesus came not only to change what people believed about God, but Jesus came to change our position, our condition, and our mission in the world. And so we're going to end this morning with these three reminders, if you're a Christian, but challenges if you're not a Christian. First of all, To claim to be the light of the world is a claim to rescue the world from its position and condition and darkness. Jesus can not only transform where you stand in relation to God, but he can change your condition in darkness. He literally can transform who you are. Not only a judicial change, right? You're no longer a lawbreaker, but an actual change. He can work in your life and expose these areas of weakness and sin and change who you are. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. Everything that you've ever been guilty for can be canceled out if you're transferred in Christ. What a powerful reminder. Look, I don't have it all together. I make mistakes all the time. I sin against my wife and my children and my church. I mean, I make mistakes all the time. But I am thankful that God has transferred me out of darkness. I am thankful that I am aware of these things and these failures. And man, I wrestle with myself. And the reason why I wrestle with myself is because God can change our condition as well. Who we are, what we think, how we feel. Look at what the Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. It says, you were formerly in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light consists in goodness. Treat people well. Be good to other people. Do good things. That's what a person that's been transformed looks like. You do good to people, not bad, not wrong. Second of all, he says, in Ephesians chapter 5, in righteousness... 
You choose to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. You choose to walk according to the word of God rather than your own sinful lifestyle. And then third of all, he says, truth. You believe what is right. You appeal to the authority of scripture. You don't base what you think and you believe off of your emotions and how you feel and what's gone right or wrong with you. You say, what does the Bible say about God's word and his law? I'm going to follow that. Last week, I challenged us. If we have some pet peeves in our mind, that we don't like, maybe about church or about life, can we back it up with a clear teaching of Scripture? Can we? Are you walking according to the truth? Are you living by the light of life of God's Word? He goes on to say in verse 10, we should try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Are you actively pursuing what is pleasing to God? Do you want to please Him? Are you searching and seeking God? I know you're there, and I don't have it all figured out, but I want to know. I want to read your word. I want to talk with other Christians. I want to pray. God, show me what is pleasing to you. He says, do not practice in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. And man, is this the battle. Yeah, we might have our position changed, but we think that we can hide and cover up the darkness in our heart and in our mind and in our actions and in our attitude. But God is the one who sees. He sees it all. And we think that, man, if we just hoard it in, we don't confess, we don't expose it, it'll go away. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this morning, if you are convinced that you should hide your sin, it is only going to get worse. If you're addicted to pornography or sexual temptation, if you're addicted to alcoholism and you're a drunk, it is only going to get worse. The Bible wants us to expose these deeds of darkness, uproot them, get them out of our life so that we can walk in the light of God. And then third and finally is simply this. Someone who has their position changed and their condition changed has their mission changed. It is irresistible to have your life changed for Jesus. When you know that God has forgiven you and you know that you're being changed into the person that God wants you to be, it should be irresistible in sharing that with other people. One interesting part about coming in contact with the light is that the light shines on you. And I want you to think of yourself this morning not as the sun that's shining your own light, but as the moon that's reflecting the light of the sun. And by the sun, I mean the Son of God. And when God's light shines in our hearts and it transforms our attitudes and our actions, that's the light that gets shared with other people. And so a lot of people aren't just going to pick up their Bible and read it and hear about the light The only light that they ever see and experience from God is you and I. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, and a lot of people, not just his disciples, but thousands of people, he said this in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but he puts it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are commanded to share, to shine, to put ourselves up on a lampstand, up on a hill. The only bad thing that you can do with your light is to hide it. And so I want to encourage you this morning that as you hear about the light of the world, Jesus, who has come to be a light to the Gentiles, that's you and I, and he exposed the deeds of our darkness, do not harden your hearts like the Pharisees. Do not leave here willfully blind and ignorant and angry because it's maybe me saying it or what you've experienced in the church. Look to Jesus, who is the light of the world, and he can change your life forever and ever. Amen. Yeah.